Dr. Keith Betteridge has been involved with research at the Ontario Veterinary College since 1986. Today, he will be sharing research on equine reproduction that has spanned decades. Welcome, Dr. Betteridge, and thank you for joining us. It's very nice to be here. Horse breeders are very interested in research delving into maintaining pregnancy. I understand that equine reproduction is quite unique. Can you explain what's so different about the equine embryo? There are many things that are uh, unique about the equine embryo. And you could go back even a stage before that and say that there's something unique about the equine ovary, because the ovary in the mare is inside out compared with the ovary in, in, in humans or cattle or sheep or pigs. And the, so that ovulation takes place in, a, in what is called the ovulation fossa in the ovary. And when the egg is shed, it has to make its way down into the uterus if it's going to be fertilized, if, it, if as a fertilized egg, it's going to develop into an embryo. But one of the unique things about the um, equine embryo is that it only gets through the fallopian tube, that's the connection between the ovary and the uterus, if it's fertilized. And actually, this is what got me interested in um, the, the details of equine reproduction, was a paper back in the middle 1960s, when some South Africans reported that they found many old unfertilized eggs in the, in the fallopian tube of mares. And um, I didn't believe it. And when I was in Ottawa, colleagues and I had the opportunity to um, use some mares that were being used into the development of tests for equine infectious anemia. And we set out to disprove this South African work. We did a lot of work and we proved them completely correct and that we were completely wrong. So that's sort of symptomatic of the way research goes and the way it should go. The embryo develops an unusual coating, which is called the capsule. And this enables the embryo to move around in the uterus. In fact, it has to move around in the uterus if pregnancy is to develop. And we've learned this from all the work that has been done with, in horse reproduction, thanks to ultrasound. The um, embryo is spherical because of the capsule and is moving around in the uterus. We can discover an awful lot of things about what's going on in early pregnancy by the use of ultrasound. I was amazed to hear samples from embryonic losses in 2008 are proving useful in studies as recent as last year's uh, at the OBC. As a researcher, who has seen technologies and research in equine reproduction evolve. Can you speak to the value of long-term studies you have been involved in? Yes, with pleasure, because um, it's a very good example of illustrating, you know, the, the adage, if life gives you lemons, find a way of making lemonade. And in our case, we were studying embryos themselves and so we were interested in getting mares pregnant and then collecting the embryo by flushing the embryos out of the, uh, out of the mare at various uh, stages, various um, ages of embryo. And occasionally we would find that a mare was pregnant at, say, um, day 12, and that was fine. And we could look forward to collecting the embryo, say, a week later. And then it would disappear. And to us, this was just a real nuisance because it meant that we, we wouldn't have that embryo to collect. And uh, so we just thought, well, that's, that's a darn nuisance. But then we realized that, in fact, we were looking at um, the early loss of embryos. And that's a very important thing to horse breeders. You say that horse breeders are interested in reproduction and well, they should be because uh, when a mare is diagnosed pregnant at um, let's say day 
14 or 16, depending on when, when your veterinarian diagnoses the pregnancy with ultrasound, around 16 or 17 percent of those pregnancies diagnosed at day 15 will not produce a foal. So that's a big loss in terms of, um, uh, of, of, of value of, of, of the uh, potential foals. And furthermore, most of those losses occur in the first 30 or 40 days. And so I like to use the, the, the two figures, 17 as being 17% of the day 15 pregnancies will not produce a foal. And 70, 70% of those losses will occur in the first six weeks of pregnancy. And that's why we've been focusing on understanding what's going on in the uterus, what sort of conversations are going on between the embryo and the mare during those crucial early days of pregnancy. Uh, so the, 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 the lemons in this case were lost pregnancies. We thought that, that was a uh, uh, just a, a loss to our program, but in fact it was it was lemonade because it gave us an opportunity to really follow those embryos, and we so we collected samples, and as it turned out, uh, in the long term, because we collected them, uh, new techniques techniques came along which we could use to investigate those samples. Can you explain how the new techniques have furthered the knowledge in the field of equine reproduction and embryonic loss? Well, of course, the first thing is, is, is the ultrasound itself. You wouldn't know you'd lost an embryo if you hadn't been able to diagnose it at a very early stage. And you can, you know, with a, with a good machine uh, and a lot of experience, you can diagnose pregnancy in a mare at, at as early as day nine or ten. And, um, and, and, and follow its growth and measure its growth um, with, with ultrasound. So that's the first thing. But I think you're probably referring to um, the, the uh, RNA sequencing, which we, we've used recently. And um, you ask if I can explain that, and certainly I can't explain it as well as the people who are doing that RNA sequencing. But basically, the, the, the RNA is um, part of the messaging system between the DNA and, 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 and the production of, of um, compounds such as proteins and, and hormones. And if you can uh, break that up and, um, and, and analyze it, you get a profile of which genes are active in the tissue that you're examining. And interestingly enough, the, the, um, the, the modern techniques for doing that are so much rooted in mathematics for analyzing the samples. that If, if, if my old mathematics teacher could um, tell people that I was doing research on reproduction with, a mathemat with mathematics, uh, my, my maths teacher would never have thought that that was a possibility. When I start, when I became interested in um, equine research, pregnancy was always looked at as though the the embryo was just a passenger in the uterus, and that it, uh, it, it would develop, and, it, and given the fullness of time, it would be born, and it was just a passenger. And it's gradually emerged since the 60s that the the embryo is a very active component. Of, um, of pregnancy. And if the embryo is not communicating with the mare, the pregnancy uh, won't develop. And understanding this two sides of the conversation, if you like, between the embryo and the, uh, and, and the, the mare is absolutely vital to understanding how normally pregnancy will develop and how uh, when an embryo is lost the, the pregnancy will fail. What opportunities has conducting research at the University of Guelph afforded and what's next? Well they, they, they've provided the wonderful facilities we, we um, had at Arco where we could um, monitor uh, mares on a daily basis 
which were kept at pasture. Was, so it was a very simple uh, set of, ex uh, of experiments to do. Our, our experiments were basically observational until we collected the samples. And then, of course, they became very um, complicated because this RNA um, sequencing that we've mentioned has given us entirely new methods of um, finding out which uh, genes are active in the lining of the uterus at a, a particular time on the one side, that's the mayor's side of the dialogue. And also we, we will be able to do it on the um, embryonic tissue. And that in fact, when you say, where do we go next? Really we've been uh, examining the, the, the mayor's side of the dialogue. And I hope that the um, embryonic side, the, the, the uh, what's what's going on in the um, embryonic tissue, will will follow on. Thank you, Dr. Bedridge. Is there anything you'd like to sum up or mention in closing? I think um, it's useful to realize the the, the, the benefits of of long term funding of research. For example. If we had let those lemons, the failed pregnancies, not um, not turn into lemonade, we we would we would be further back. And they've only turned into lemonade because of the the developments in um, in this case RNA sequencing, which allow us to tackle it with tools that were unimaginable when we started this work. And so by um, taking care to uh, conserve tissues so that they will be useful to others in future. I think it makes a, 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 a good basis for um, preparing for the future and for future techniques, which will certainly come along. And there, we haven't reached the end of the road in, in new techniques, and there will be um, many more to um, take a that will be able to take advantage of tissues that we've collected during our experiments. I also like to say that uh, by financing research uh, of, of this nature, we are gradually building up um, information that uh, will help the horse breeder um, perhaps prevent the the losses the the seventeen percent that I referred to uh, of the pregnancies that are lost. <laughs>